Okay, if you can uh, take your seats, please. All right, well, we got a small, intimate crowd, and, uh, but it's also going to be on video. It goes on the website. We have a uh, journalist here that's going to go ahead and uh, write a story for us as well. So uh, we're glad that you're all here. And, uh, you know, you know the, um, you're, you know, you're welcome up here. And uh, we got, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do my intro. And included in my intro is an um, intro very briefly of the three speakers. So welcome, everyone, to uh, Redbird Resilience Program of One for All and All for One. I am Larry Henley, Vice President of Redbird Resilient. John Stoops is President of Redbird Resilient. He was our greeter tonight. So, um, if you happen to uh, see the poster and you came for the po uh, for the uh, popcorn and the water, uh, that was my bad. I didn't cover all the details. So, uh, if you were here for that, I'm sorry for the bait and switch. Okay. <laughs> Tonight's program uh, uh, does not come out come without some controversy. Safety of COVID vaccine seems to have some controversy, okay? Uh, but if we um, pause for a moment, uh, we could replace uh, this topic with racism, elections, COVID stay-at-home orders, or tensions with friends, loved ones, workers, uh, or at your church uh, locally, or the global church. Tonight we allocate about 20% of our time uh, with respected local Dr. D David Tomchek. Dr. Tomchek is also the interim director of uh, Ashland County Health Department. About 55% of our time is earmarked for how we relate and deal with uh, within ourselves and outside of our, I'm sorry, for how we relate and deal with life within ourselves and outside of ourselves. Uh, Steve Stone has uh, 30 minutes uh, tonight, and the other three segments have 20 minutes. Uh, Steve recently retired as Executive Director of Ashland County Mental Health and Recovery Board and will speak on living relationally. Uh, Reverend uh, Vince Hawk, um, to my back, obviously, uh, Past, has been a pastor at uh, St. Peter Catholic Church since 2006, and uh, he will speak on respect of conscience. Uh, we will end with a Q&A, and I hope if you uh, have comments, this doesn't look like a rowdy crowd, but I'm going to stick with my script. Uh, we will end with a Q&A, and I hope if you have comments, questions, or strong feelings that you will feel safe uh, to uh, come to the mic and express those. Um, I promise that our goal is that each person is treated with respect as an individual. In that sense, we can say all for one. Um, in return, we ask you to address the speakers with respect, even with your strong convictions and emotions, and in that sense, one for all. We all live life framed up by a journey of freedom and responsibility. So without further ado, I welcome our first speaker, Steve Stone. Thank you, Larry. Thanks, everybody, for coming out this evening. Um, glad to share the stage tonight with uh, my esteemed colleagues here. Um, I'm going to be addressing issues around uh, COVID uh, from more of the mental health perspective. And um, so we know that uh, COVID has had a, a significant impact on everybody's life in one way or another. I mean, there's physical aspects to this. Um, there's psychological aspects, and then there's social aspects to this. And I'm going to be focusing mostly on the psychological and social uh, pieces of this. Uh, but for each of those, there are certain tools, certain principles, certain um, uh, recommendations that uh, um, folks are making. For, like, for example, managing the physical um, side of things. We know that there's things like wearing masks and uh, hand washing and... Um, um, physical distancing are important. There's also ways that we can address some of the other aspects too, like the psychological impact uh, and the relation, relational impact. Um, and so we're going to be talking about uh, those things today. 
Um, I was also asked to mention um, uh, something and speak a little bit to the issue of isolation. And I want to do that right up front because I think it really um, is something that un is, is sort of threaded throughout. I think everything that we talk about uh, here in the next uh, uh, tw 20 or 30 minutes is, is going to speak in some way to, uh, to this issue of isolation. Um, but you know what strikes me about isolation? Um, I had kind of an aha moment. Shortly after the pandemic hit, um, um, there was a woman that I know who had been uh, a recluse for 15, 20 years, uh, hardly ever out of her house, lived with her um, uh, aging mother, um, had uh, essentially no friends and no other family that she had contact with, um, rarely went out to the store, rarely did anything outside the house. Um, but I had uh, come to know her, and I had um, uh, and continued to have um, uh, regular contacts with her by, by phone and that. What was interesting is uh, about um, three or four weeks into the um, shutdown, um, I, she called me up, and she was in a panic. And I said, well, what's the matter? And she said, I've never felt so isolated in my whole life. Now, here's a person who had not been out of the house in 15 or 20 years, right? What struck me at that moment was that isolation is not a social phenomenon. It's a psychological phenomenon. Isolation occurs here. It doesn't occur out here. Um, we've all heard about people who feel all alone even when they're in a big crowd, right? So, uh, so this idea of isolation, it's, it's an interesting um, uh, you know, thing. And the other part of this um, that, that I, I think about sometimes, is isolation always a bad thing? Is it not, a, is it not okay to, to, to find ways to enjoy spending time by yourself and not around other people? In fact, sometimes isolation can be a good thing. Um, and I think of Henry David Thoreau who left everything and took an ax and went to live in the woods, right? Uh, he didn't want to be around people for a while. So, um, so there is an element that, you know, isolation, uh, even though we may not choose it, may be something that we can learn to live with and actually find a way to grow uh, and learn to enjoy spending more time with ourselves. Um, so, um, as we talk about, um, you know, flattening the, the curve, um, the physical health uh, issues that we can do, I think we can also flatten the curve with respect to um, the impact that the um, uh, pandemic is having on uh, people psychologically. And um, uh, if we do the basic, simple things that uh, we need to do, uh, we can probably avoid uh, having to seek professional help or uh, any type of um, um, uh, formal outside uh, assistance. Not to say that it's not available, and if you need it, take advantage of it. But I think there's a whole lot that we can do um, to prevent that from even needing to happen. So what I'd like to do uh, is to share with you some things that I've collected over the years that uh, I have found useful and folks that I have shared them with uh, often find useful. And I think of these as tools and resources that we would want in our toolbox of life, so to speak. Um, these um, um, quotes, uh, anecdotes, little stories that I'm gonna share with you are going to raise uh, principles that are uh, not rocket science. They're pretty basic things. Um, is it okay if I take my mask off? Thank you. Sounds better too, doesn't it? Um, so a, a collection of quotes, uh, brief writings uh, of things. Um, but again, these are not new ideas. These are very basic uh, elements um, uh, or tools that I would, uh, would suggest we remind ourselves of. So these are more reminders, and I'm suggesting let's dust some of these ideas off if they've gotten dusty, and let's sharpen them up. Because unless we attend to the basics, um, then there's no point in, in looking at, uh, uh, beyond that. Let's start with the basics, and if that's not working for us, then we can look at some other options. I think um, about the analogy sometimes of, a, of a, an athlete, say a golfer or a batter, who happens to be in a slump. 
and uh, they're not hitting very well. Um, well, their coach is going to take them aside, and the first thing the coach is going to say is not, gee whiz, there's this new material that they're making the bats out of now, or a new glove that came out, or a new way to grip the bat. Um, what do they do? They start by taking a video of the person batting or golfing, and then they analyze it, and they go back to basics. How are your feet? How are your hips? How is your grip? How is your swing, right? So you don't start by solving a problem until you do the basic things that make sense up front. And if that doesn't work, then you can move to the next step. We live in two worlds, um, and um, Larry alluded to that, one for all and all for one, right? We all live in two worlds. We live in this world inside of our head, okay? Um, our thoughts, our feelings, our perceptions, our experiences. Um, and then we live in this outside world of relationships, of contact with other people, of family, friends, uh, co-workers, and so on. And so we're going to try to tie those two things together because they're very, very closely related. In fact, um, we really can't talk about mental health without talking about relational health. Um, if we're not uh, in good, um, uh, healthy relationships with the people around us, it's uh, certainly going to affect our mental health, isn't it? Um, and if our mental health isn't attended to, uh, it's going to affect our relationships. So these things really go hand in hand. So we've got to start um, you know, the process by, uh, first of all, we need to learn to take good care of ourselves, right? We've all... Um, um, most of us, anyway, have been on an airplane before, and we know that when you're out on the tarmac, the stewardess comes out, and she gives you the spiel, right? And, and then she talks about the, the oxygen masks dropping from uh, the ceiling of the cabin. And what does she say? Take that oxygen mask. If there's a young child or somebody disabled next to you, uh, don't do anything until you get the mask on them? No. They say, first, put the mask on yourself. Okay. Once you have the mask secure, uh, then you can begin to help other people. Um, so I think that's a great metaphor for some of what we're talking about this evening. <clears throat> self um, self care um, it really starts by uh, being self aware, right? We really need to learn to pay more attention to what's going on inside. The world that we live in has never been filled with more distractions, right? With televisions and screens and all this stuff going on out here. But this idea of being able to reflect um, and be introspective is really important. Um, we need to learn to do that because otherwise we become uh, like we're on autopilot and we begin to act and react to things without being really thoughtful. And that's very, very dangerous. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but being able to rely on these natural supports and do the things um, uh, in, our, in our daily lives to, um, uh, to foster those good, healthy relationships is really critical. Um, here's the, 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 the sort of the core, I think, of what I hope to, to uh, um, get across this evening. Um, it's about expectations and relationships, but it's about um, more than that. It's about, um, in life, looking at um, what things we have control over and what things we don't have control over. Many of you have heard the serenity prayer before, right? Um, the serenity prayer talks about, um, God grant me the courage to change the things that I can, right? Um, and then... Um, to accept the things that I can't, and then the wisdom to know the difference. Okay, we can't control everything, right? We can't control this pandemic. What can we control? Our behavior. You know, we can wear masks, we can do certain things. Um, that we can do, but we can't control this pandemic. But if we keep all of our, our energy and, and focus on the pandemic that is outside of our control, all that's going to do is make us more anxious, more fearful, um, um, more disconcerted, if you will. The thing that's going to carry us through uh, the pandemic or any other challenge that life has to offer is our attitude. Anybody here a pilot? 
No, me either. <laughs> but I know some pilots, and I remember hearing a pilot talk about the attitude indicator in their aircraft. And the attitude indicator is um, the, the, the instrument on the panel that shows how the plane is positioned in, 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 in orientation or with respect to the horizon, right? And so it's all about keeping the plane level on the horizon and making sure we know exactly how much we are varying from that. Um, uh, the, the definition of an attitude indicator is uh, that it's a flight in instrument that informs the pilot of the aircraft orientation relative to the Earth's horizon and gives an immediate indication of the smallest orientation change. So I would suggest that we all need to have a good attitude indicator. That's that self-awareness and to really pay attention to this. And the horizon, if you will, um, is, is made up of these basic principles that I'm sharing with you um, over the next few minutes here. And if we keep those things in mind and we keep our attitude aligned with these principles, then um, we're going to have a lot smoother flight, if you will, um, than if we um, uh, either overlook or dismiss those things. In fact, um, one of my favorite psychologists, um, William James, um, has a great quote. William James was popular during the 1800s, a psychology professor uh, up at uh, Harvard and um, a, a great, brilliant mind. But one of the things he said here is, the greatest discovery of my generation is that a human being can alter his life by altering his attitudes. Okay? that we are not simply victims of everything that's happening around us, but there is a lot that we can control, but it starts with controlling our attitude. Charles Swindle, who's a faith teacher, puts it this way, and this is something my mother had given me years ago when I was in college, and it's something that uh, I've referred back to many, many times, and I've shared it with people who have also found it helpful, so I'd like to just share it with you tonight. And it's simply called attitude. And Charlie Swindle says, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It's more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. Attitude is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I'm convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. One way that that can play out um, in, in our day-to-day -day life is, um, you know, we, we talk about life being a mixed bag, right? I don't care how good or how bad your life is, it's mixed. Everybody who's had a, a terrible experiences of the, in their life can also find things that were enriching, that were positive, that were things to celebrate, okay? Uh, people that seem to be always happy and should be, you know, perpetually just uh, carefree, um, if you talk to them long enough, you'll find that they've had hardship and agony and distress and suffering, okay? So life is a mixed bag uh, for, for all of us. Um, and so, you know, I think especially when we're feeling really stressed, one thing that we want to do is we want to look at the half full part of the glass, Right? Uh, kind of the counter blessings, right? Let's look and let's not focus on all the negative. Let's look at some of the positive stuff. So that's a big attitude adjustment, right? If we can kind of shift our focus um, and look at that half full part of the glass, we don't want to ignore the half empty. We don't want to ignore the things that are difficult or challenging or um, um, things that concern us. But that's not what we want to have our focus because that'll then uh, begin to eclipse um, the, the positive things and overshadow that. And um, so it's important that we pay attention to both of those uh, areas. But really, let's try to keep focused on uh, what's gone right, what's going well in life. 
Um, I think about um, attitude with respect to suffering. Uh, Viktor Frankl, um, some of you know, um, was a uh, prisoner of war uh, during the Nazi, um, um, in the Nazi uh, concentration camp and wrote a series, uh, several different books, but the most popular one is called Man's Search for Meaning. And Viktor Frankl talks about how the suffering that was endured by the, uh, the inmates at these camps, um, in many cases, actually moved these folks in ways to find purpose and meaning in their suffering in spite of what was going on around them. They found a way to, um, um, to adjust their attitude, if you will. Um, I call this um, composting, that when life hands us a bunch of really lousy stuff and um, we feel like we've just had a big pile of manure dumped on us, um, after we collect ourselves and we have a chance to step back for a minute, we can reframe that and we can say, you know what, um, this doesn't have to be a big pile of manure uh, if I find a way to incorporate it into my life and learn from these experiences, I can use this as fertilizer because manure and fertilizer are essentially the same thing, aren't they? But what's different? It's our attitude. Okay, the way we look at it, the way we approach it. And if we see it as only something negative and that we're a victim and that we can't do anything about it, um, then we're going to get mired down in it and it's not going to be pretty. But if we can find the wherewithal to step back, take a couple deep breaths and say, gee whiz, what can I learn from this experience? Then we can take that suffering and transform it into a meaningful experience that actually moves us uh, forward and helps us to grow. I think we can also um, look at composting uh, relationally. And I think of another great psychologist by the name of Carl Jung, um, who I admire greatly. Um, but uh, Carl Jung talks about uh, composting relationship issues. He, he talks about it this way. He says, everything that irritates us about others can lead us to an understanding of ourselves. Huh, about that. So that's a little bit of a reframing, isn't it? That uh, rather than see you as an adversary, I can maybe look at you as a teacher. Maybe there's something you can teach me about myself when you push those buttons that you may not have installed, but you're certainly pushing them, right? Um, so what can we learn about ourselves in situations like that? We talk a lot about um, um, social distancing during the pandemic, and um, I'd like to... Um, reframe that uh, very simply and, and talk about it more as um, being social, uh, uh, physically distant but remaining socially connected and engaged. And I think that many, most, maybe all of us have found ways to do that, that we can still maintain those social connections and those relationships even if we cannot always be present with people like we had before or like we'd like to be. <clears throat> Another uh, great psychologist, and I did um, uh, send Larry and John uh, some of these um, little quotes and things, um, and you'll get a handout on your way out uh, that have some of these on there. So if there's a, a nugget in here that you find helpful, uh, you'll be able to take that home and uh, put it up in your refrigerator or something and use that um, to kind of adjust uh, your attitude. I do that kind of stuff all the time. John Kabat-Zinn, another uh, psychologist, he's known for his work around mindfulness and that, um, but he says, we humans are intimately connected, interconnected. We humans are intimately interconnected. How we treat each other matters. Very, very important. At this point, and I've taken about an hour, hour and a half presentation, I'm trying to condense it down, but at this point I would show a video um, by Brene Brown, a social worker on empathy. Um, and the, um, the link to that will be in the handout that you get later. So if you're interested in it, you can, you can go to the YouTube and, um, and um, look at that video. Um, but, um, you know, we talked about Hero, uh, Thoreau before uh, and uh, his taking an ax and going out to is intentionally isolate himself. Um, 
But you know, he also had tremendous admiration and empathy for uh, his fellow human beings. And uh, a quote I love of his uh, speaks to this idea of empathy. And it says, could a greater miracle take place than for us to look through each other's eyes for an instant, right? We don't really know a lot of um, what somebody might be bringing into a situation, what their history is, what their story is. Um, I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. But first, I want to read a, a, a short piece by Sidney Harris. Um, some of you may remember him. He was a syndicated columnist. I worked for the Chicago Daily News. And he, uh, he wrote in one of his columns, he said this. I walked with a friend, a Quaker, to the newsstand the other night, and he bought a paper, thanking the newsboy politely. The newsboy didn't even acknowledge it. A solemn fellow, isn't he, I commented. Oh, he's that way every night, shrugged my friend. Then why do you continue to be so polite to him, I asked. Why not, said my friend. Why should I let him decide how I'm going to act? As I thought about this incident later, it occurred to me that the important word was act. My friend acts towards people. Most of us react toward them. He has a sense of inner balance, which is lacking in most of us. He knows who he is, what he stands for, how he should behave. He refuses to return incivility for incivility because then he would no longer be in command of his own conduct. Nobody is unhappier than the perpetual reactor. His center of emotional gravity is not rooted within himself where it belongs, but in the world outside it. His temperature is always being raised or lowered by the social climate around him, and he's a mere creature at the mercy of these elements. Praise gives him a feeling of euphoria, which is false, because it does not last and does not come from self-approval. Criticism depresses him more than it should, because it confirms his own secretly shaken opinion of himself. Snubs hurt him, and the merest suspicion of unpopularity in any quarter rouses him to bitterness. Serenity cannot be achieved until we become the masters of our own actions and attitudes. To let another determine whether we shall be rude or gracious, elated or depressed, is to relinquish control over our own personalities, which is ultimately all we possess. The only true possession is self-possession. Again, the only thing we really can control is within ourselves, and it's our attitude. Um, Victor Frankl, that I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, um, says this that I think is, is very relevant. And of course, he's talking about people who have been uh, extremely traumatized, right? Uh, and some of the lessons that he learned um, uh, in, in those experiences. Um, and so he said this, between stimulus and response, there is a space. Stimulus and response. So somebody says something, and I'm going to react to that. I'm going to say something. I'm going to respond to that person, okay? Um, in that space between stimulus and what, how I respond, in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and freedom, okay? So to not just be automatically reacting to things that are going on around us, but to really be thoughtful and intentional and act from that center, from that, from that attitude indicator, okay? And what are the things that are gonna keep things um, settled and are aligned with these principles and these values that we're talking about? I'm gonna wrap it up here. Um, we got Three minutes, okay? So I am going to wrap it up here. Um, and before, I've got one little story that I want to close with. Um, and, um, and then I, I, but before I do that, I want to share some resources with you. Um, one of them, and again, there'll be links to these resources on the handouts that you get um, uh, on your way out this evening. One is um, a link uh, and a little bit of information to an app uh, for your phone for mobile cellular phones. It's called Healthy Ashland. 
and this was put together last year by the Mental Health and Recovery Board, um, and it's packed full of all kinds of uh, stress management, relaxation tools, um, things to do, activities where you can go out and be safe outside, uh, and, and, and it's tied to a, a lot of community events uh, and social calendars and those kinds of things, but there's just a ton of stuff uh, on that app, and it, there's no cost to it. So um, if you're uh, so inclined, I would encourage you to, to download that and check it out. The other thing that um, was just released by the Mental Health Board um, just this week is a resiliency toolkit. Um, this is a toolkit for parents and any caregivers of children uh, to teach them about uh, emotional regulation, how to manage their emotions, how to deal with frustration and anger, uh, how to solve problems, um, all kinds of really good skills that uh, children need to, uh, uh, to be resilient. Um, and there's information about that uh, also on the uh, link. Um, and there's a, a couple of things there. One is about a 30-minute video uh, that Dr. Diane Carther, who put this toolkit together, did, and she explains the toolkits and the elements in the toolkit and how to use them. And then on the website, um, which is also linked there, are um, all kinds of resources and things that can be downloaded, games to play with children, other kinds of things um, uh, that are similar. So um, some very good resources in there. Um, and then, of course, you will get the, you will get the handout. Um, but I, there's one more story I want to share with you because I think it really helps to bridge this idea of, you know, what's going on inside of me and my attitude and the way that I interact with other people, right? Uh, and, and if we ever need to be uh, more supportive uh, and more thoughtful and more intentional about um, uh, supporting and taking care of the people around us, um, I think that's a lesson that we've all learned through COVID, right? That we are in this together um, and that we are stronger together and that even if we are different, uh, there's strength in our diversity. But one time there was a, and you may have heard this story before, um, um, but I think uh, even if you have, it's, it's worth repeating. Um, it's called the story of two wolves. It's a Native American story uh, about an old Cherokee who was teaching his grandson about, about life. And the grandson had uh, come to his grandfather very upset and crying because he'd been bullied by some of his peers and he was really angry and upset about the way he was treated. He says, Grandfather, I'm gonna make them pay someday for what they've done to me, carrying great bitterness and resentment. The grandfather told him, a fight is going on inside of me, he said to the boy. It's a terrible fight and it's between two wolves. One is evil. His anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. Then he went on. The other wolf is good. His joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside of you and goes on inside of every other person too. And the grandson thought about this for a minute and then he looked up at his grandfather and he said, which wolf will win? And the grandfather looked down and he said, the one that you feed. Really important, really important. So we want to make sure we're feeding the right stuff, right? And we're feeding the right attitude, that we're, we're paying attention to what's going on inside and the way that we're interacting with other people and um, um, trying to overlook maybe a lot of our differences, uh, a lot of our, you know, everybody's got a story, right? Um, people uh, don't exist in a vacuum. We are a culmination of our history. And when you meet people, uh, I often say it's like opening up a book in the middle. And you really don't know what's happened in the first part of the book. So reserve judgment and uh, try to overlook a lot of the things that might, you might find troubling and try to look behind that to the person. Because uh, inevitably, you'll find that once you understand the story, it changes the picture. So my final comment to you is that in a world where we can be anything, 
Be kind. Thank you. So the topic of my portion of this presentation is respect of conscience. I have to admit this is a, a tough topic for 20 minutes, uh, given, uh, given everything that would really relate to, uh, to this topic. There's courses and courses uh, on this. So to narrow that down was quite a challenge, but I, I want to thank you for the wolf story there, because I, I think that that's going to be uh, an important uh, launching point for us. You know, that, that struggle uh, between the good things and the bad things, good and evil, right? So what is uh, our goal in conscience? Ultimately, if I want to boil this down to a one-line talk and be done, it's do good, avoid evil, right? I could go sit down now, um, but then uh, there'd be too much time left over. So... <clears throat> So I want to talk about conscience. I want to give us a, kind of a definition for conscience to use. And, and so that conscience definition that I want to use tonight is the inner sense of right and wrong that enables individuals to discern moral choices freely. Let me give that to you again. Conscience is the inner sense of right and wrong that enables individuals to discern moral choices freely. You know, this, uh, this conscience is often Im imagined in the uh, illustrations of cartoon uh, pictures as a, as a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other shoulder, right? Kind of uh, whispering in our ears, trying to, to get us to do the, the good thing or the, the wrong thing, you know? And, and uh, there's, there's an aspect to that, but that's not quite conscience because conscience... Is, is deeper. It's deeper. It's really written on the, the heart of us. When I say heart, I mean the core of us, right? The core of us, there's, there's a, a law written that really drives us, causes us to want good. To want good. So in that definition, there's a number of, of areas that, uh, that we probably need to take a, take a look at. So one of the things was moral choices. What's a, a moral choice? Moral choice is committing to act for what one believes is right and good. Committing to act for what one believes is right and good. Now, in that moral choice, it's not just... Mm, what do I think? What do I feel? It's more than that, right? It's, it's a, an informed uh, choice. It's an informed choice. So we need to take the opportunity to look for what is true. We need to look for what is true in making those, those decisions, those moral choices about what one believes is right and good. And then to act on that. That's really the, the choice we want to make. But we want to act on that freely, right? We don't want to be coerced in, in that action. Um, when we're talking about conscience and moral choices, it's a, it's a free action, right? No coercion. When, uh, when I'm preparing a couple for marriage uh, in, our, in our Catholic tradition, we have, to, uh, we have to make sure that a couple is free to marry, right? That there's... There's no impediments to that marriage. And one of those impediments would be, you know, is someone causing you to say you need to do this? Is it going to be a shotgun wedding, right? You know, that, uh, that kind of reality. We need to make sure that that's not the case and that, that they're in a moral situation able to be, um, to be free, right? So that's um, kind of the, uh, the heart of it. In a, 
I think in our, our crowd here tonight, it's safe to kind of stick with the, the Judeo-Christian kind of approach to uh, the uh, relationship of, of God in, in the midst of our conscience. So we talk about uh, a law, a natural law written on our heart, written by our creator, right? Written by God. And that awareness that each and every one of us is made in the image and likeness of God. And in, in, in that image and likeness, I believe, comes from that, that reality of God, the creator, has given us an immortal soul and he's given us the, that immortal soul through the gifts of intelligence and reason. He's given us intelligence and reason. It's something we have different than all the other creatures in the world, right? All the other creation, we are different because of that gift. And, and God has ordered creation. I mean, if we went back to the book of Genesis, to the creation stories that are there, you know, we would see that we as people, human beings, have been kind of given a place in the order of creation at the top, right? You know, man named the animals. He, he did all of those things. Um, and, and so there's a response there that, that orders us in a different relationship than, than the other creatures. But we also, and, and, and God has kind of written as part of our, on our heart, the idea that we are um, to seek truth, good, and beauty, right? Truth, good, and beauty. And don't we, don't we seek that in our lives? I mean, if we think about our lives, we, uh, we really do spend a lot of time trying to figure out truth. Truth. You know, we ask the question, is, is the... Is the news that I'm hearing, is that true? Is that not true? Right? We, we try to discern all of those kinds of, of realities in our lives. We, we want that truth, but what's, what's the heart of the truth? That heart of the truth is that, that we are created in God's image, and everybody around us is created in God's image. And as we recognize that, there's a dignity of person We'll, we'll get to that in a moment. We know that there's brokenness in the world because of the fall. So we suffer the impact of original sin. We know that original sin kind of darkens uh, our minds a little bit, weakens our wills, and inclines us to sin. You know, our, our, our Lord delivers us from that original sin but not necessarily from the effects of that or the effects of the inclination to sin. So we stand in our lives in, in attention, right? There's, uh, there's the good that God has written on our hearts, written at the core of our very being, and, and we want to do that. But then sin uh, clouds that, confuses us, blinds us a little bit, and so often, we uh, kind of have an impulse towards something other. And it's usually an impulse in the idea that this is going to uh, satisfy me. Whatever that is, right? This is going to satisfy me. But it doesn't always satisfy. You know, the only thing that's really going to satisfy us is really being good. Being in that relationship with, in good relationship with the people around us, the community. You know, to borrow from scripture, it's loving one another, right? And it's also, I dare to say, being in relationship with God, right? Being in relationship with the creator in response to that goodness. We need to strive for that goodness. I have an example of a, of a friend of mine, a friend of mine who um, he, he does a good job of, of looking for that satisfaction in life, does a good job of looking for that satisfaction, and he does things that are they're not, they're not bad by themselves, 
right? So for one, one item, he, he, he went bowling, right? Well, he wanted to be the perfect bowler. He wanted to bowl a 300 every time he went bowling. And he, he didn't do it, couldn't do it. Got better and better, but couldn't quite get there. Never satisfied, right? So he stopped bowling, and he took up the guitar, right? Took up the guitar. And all he did, he took his guitar to work. Any chance he got, he'd work on playing the guitar. And I, I don't know if he wanted to be Elvis or exactly what, but, you know, the, the reality was that it took away from absolutely everything else, and while it was satisfying trying to get there, was never satisfied in the end, right? Never satisfied in the end. Because it's those things which might even appear to be good, you know, nothing wrong with either of those examples, but when we take them to the extreme, they can become problematic, right? When we're looking to satisfy our, our most inner desires, there's only one place that we're really going to so find that, and that is in goodness, in goodness, right? And so when we talk about um, conscience, we need to talk about the community. We need to talk about the value and the dignity of a person, of every person, right? The goal of human life, even with its imperfections and struggles, has a profound unity of physical and spiritual dimensions. And that's what makes our lives sacred. It's distinct, again, from all of the other forms of creation. And it is because it's imprinted with the image of our Creator. That which the Creator has written deep in our hearts. In my definition of conscience, freedom was, freedom was an important part of that definition. And without freedom, I don't think we can speak meaningfully about morality or any kind of moral responsibility. Human freedom is more than the capacity to choose between two different things, between this and that. It's God's given power to become who he created us to be, to share a union with him. What does God want for us? What does the creator want for us? He really wants us to flourish. He wants us to flourish. He wants us to be joyful. He wants us to, to live life to the full. So he doesn't want us to get caught up in those things that, that we think might uh, bring us satisfaction, right? He wants us to, to really have what is going to bring that satisfaction. And of course, that happens when we live in a community, support that community, be part of that community, but also recognize that, that there, the Creator has called us to some good in that. There's a harmony that we strive for, a real, true peace, not a peace uh, like the, the two brothers who shared a room and fought you know, because that's what brothers do, right? Not that kind of, that, that when they got in a big argument, they rolled the tape across the floor and said, uh, that side's yours, this side's mine, and we're going to live happily ever after until that one toe goes over the line, right? That, that's a tenuous piece. That's not a true piece, right? Um, and, and God wants a true piece for us. And so again, we talked about intelligence, and free will, and that lies in our decision to say yes to the creator, yes to the good, yes to love, right? And when we're willing to, to say that and do that, you know, there's going to be joy. And sometimes, uh, you know, folks get hung up on, you know, the, the rules of the community, the rules of a church community even, right? But in reality, those are helped tools, signposts, if you will, to, to drive us in a direction that's going to bring about fulfillment and joy, right? The problem is today that many people understand human freedom as merely the ability to make a choice, to make a choice with no objective norm or good 
as the goal, right? It's, it's what I want. Uh, I call it, you know, remember the Burger King uh, advertising? Your way right away? You know, this is the Burger King culture, right? The Burger King culture is I get it my way right away, and, and really, that doesn't work. That's not going to bring about flourishing or peace because my way and your way are going to be so different, maybe. And that, that reality is that there, there needs to be, there's objective truth, and there's good that should be our goal. There's good that should be our goal. When we talk about a, a moral action, there's, there's certain things that we need to have as a part of that. So every moral action convi- con- consists of three components. There's the objective act, that idea of what do we do? What do we do? The subjective goal or intention, why do we do what we do? And then there's the concrete situation or circumstances in which we perform the act. The where, the when, the how, the with whom, the consequences of that action, the circumstances of that action. Those three components all need to be there for an individual to um, be morally good, the object or what we are doing must be good, objectively good. Some acts, apart from their intention or reason for doing them, are always wrong because they go against the fundamental or basic human good that ought never be compromised. So examples of that might be the direct killing of innocents, torture, rape. Those would be examples that are always, always wrong. And those acts are often referred to as intrinsically evil acts, meaning that they're wrong in themselves apart from the reason they are done or the circumstance that surrounds them. And then the goal, the end of the intention, is the part of the moral act that lies within the heart of the person. For this reason, we say that the intention is the subjective element of the moral act So for an act to be morally good, one's intention must be good. If we're motivated to do something by a bad intention, even if it's an objectively good action, our action is morally evil, morally wrong. We should also uh, recognize that good intention can't make a bad thing good, something that's intrinsically evil, as I mentioned. We can never do something wrong or evil in order to bring about a good. So that's the meaning of the saying, the ends don't justify the means, right? We want to be able to make sure that we are acting good and upright all the way through the process. It's really hard to uh, talk about the moral life and conscience without acknowledging the reality of, of brokenness or sin in the world. Our own sinfulness and our need for God's mercy is important for us. When the existence of sin is denied, it can result in spiritual and psychological damage because it is ultimately a denial of truth, truth about ourselves. Admitting the reality of sin helps us to be truthful with ourselves, and it opens up the opportunity for that healing that we need. You know, you have to acknowledge you have a problem, right? When you acknowledge you have a problem, then you can begin to fix it and work on that. And so in so many aspects of our lives today, we miss, we miss the opportunities to really recognize that which is um, a formed conscience, formed on on the information around us, um, to really learn and take the time to allow ourselves in in a deep way. That conscience formation, it happens throughout all of our lives. It begins as we're little children, right? It's the, it's the little things, uh, you know, parents responding to their children, you know, with praise. This is a good thing. And no, 
right? No, those things are the beginnings of the shapings of, of, you know, of our conscience, but there's also that which is already there, which the parent's role and responsibility is to help um, bring out. Bring out. Not just the parent's role and responsibility, but, but really the community's role and responsibility. Right? It takes, it takes all of us. It takes all of us to, to witness that. To make examples for the community around us of, of good choices and, and explaining how we come to those choices and how we understand those choices and how we understand you know, our relationship to the community, our relationship to others. Virtue is another part of, of this topic of conscience formation. We want to live virtuous lives. We want to live virtuous lives. Well, we should want to live virtuous lives anyway, right? Um, and how do we do that? How do we, how do we practice making these good decisions you know, it's, uh, it's like going back to the, to the batting cages or the golf uh, driving range, right, to, to practice. You practice, you practice. You know, the, the best way to reinforce uh, good conscience formation is to keep doing the good things over and over again. Allowing ourselves to grow in, uh, in that goodness being able to then spread that and witness that to the world around us, to the community around us, transforms lives, transforms hearts, which will ultimately transform the world around us. There's goodness in God's action. There's goodness in the community around us. Yes, sometimes clouded by uh, brokenness, clouded by sinfulness, clouded by... um, Information that is not uh, good and true and beautiful, right? So the challenge for us is to always look for those things that are going to, uh, to bring goodness. My, my, um, my advice to uh, folks uh, of late, you know, they've, they've asked me questions like, how do I respond to the news, right? Like, and there's lots of news. Uh, in, in some cases, it's, it's church news that that is not necessarily bringing about life, joy, or hope. You know, it's not good, true, or beautiful, right? There's, uh, there's that reality. And the challenge for us is to not, to not deny the, the truth of that, but, but to look at opportunities where we can change the perspective and recognize joy, recognize the goodness. And if the, if the stories don't do that, if the news isn't doing that, well... Maybe I need to find a different place to get that news, right? So that it can bring us uh, life, bring us joy, bring us hope. Because as as we draw closer in in forming our conscience and moving towards the good, you know, standing in that that tension, like there's there's the bad and the good, but I want to lean this way to the good. I want to lean to the good. And in doing that, there's going to be life. Joy, hope, promise. And that life, joy, hope, and promise is going to allow me or any person who who does that to really flourish and to grow and and be able to witness in the world the goodness that that we are all called to in love for one another. Well, thank you, uh, Father Hawk and uh, Steve. Um, the uh, <clears throat> how am I going to follow those two talks <laughs> with a dry talk about vaccine? <laughs> so thanks you. <laughs> and as I was listening, um, I thought maybe I'd start with uh, before I bore you with numbers and things like that. Um, a little story about attitude. Um, uh, somewhere about a year ago, um, the first case of COVID that I, I diagnosed, um, 
this person came in, said they had uh, just the, the normal um, allergies, sinus infection, something like that. Um, and I thought it was appropriate to test. We finally had testing available. A um, little reluctant to do it, but agreed. Um, and turned out to be positive. Uh, at that time, it took two or three days to get the test back um, and called with the results. And I got laid into. Um, uh, can't be. Um, you're going to hear from my lawyer. Uh, <laughs> uh, there was a lot of anger. And I reacted. You know? uh, uh, there was the uh, anger back. How, how, how dare this be questioned? Um, but then it's, take a moment and, and understand where that's coming from. There was fear, not just anger. Uh, it was primarily fear. Um, new disease, hearing all the horror stories. Had been to work, worried about their job. Um, and uh, it was just getting, working through those concerns um, and that that person was going to be fine uh, and the illness was going to go away and they were not going to lose their job. Uh, and um, uh, taught, taught uh, just another lesson on <clears throat> uh, that reacting and uh, uh, delivering, at the time, what was thought to be devastating news. So um, now comes the boring part, I guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, when we first approached about talking about this and looking at the timing on it, and it was right around the time vaccine was just getting rolled out. Uh, I'm thinking, wow, this is going to be a little bit on the late side for this because hopefully we're just in kind of a mop-up operation at this point, and, and uh, as long as we have supplies available. Um, but, it, you know, it turns out it's probably a reasonable time to talk about it. Um, there's been a lot of uh, success in distribution. Um, uh, lots of people have, have uh, 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 availed themselves of the, the vaccine, and, um, but there's still a, a bunch to go. So you know, we're looking at this disease state that's um, worldwide, 150 million cases, 3 million dead, U.S., 32 million cases, approaching 600,000 dead. Um, uh, it's here. Um, there's, uh, you know, local, uh, I'd say right now, I'm not seeing a bunch of cases, but it's still sporadic. And, and um, as my impression over the last year is, as we've seen spikes in the bigger population centers, it's sort of like the ripples in the pond. It shows up here a little bit later. Maybe not as big a bumps, but it's still around. So this thing isn't going away. Um, we're we're going to be dealing with this for a while, but hopefully, uh, uh, again, we have uh, a way forward and a, and a way out. Um, so a uh, story about back in around the holidays, uh, uh, Thanksgiving time. The, uh, when, when, when numbers were really pretty bad uh, locally and regionally, um, uh, talk at the uh, county emergency management at the time was we were out of morgue space. Um, you don't think of a place like Ashland County um, having that kind of difficulty. That's in New York. That's in LA. That's in Italy. It's in Spain. But it was here. Um, we were this close to the backup plan for an emergency morgue, which was purchasing a refrigerated trailer from one of the trucking companies. So again, it's local, it's here. Um, a year ago, we thought, you know, everybody's going to know somebody who has had this illness, and now everybody knows somebody has died from it. So uh, 
anyway. So what is this thing? Everybody's seen pictures of the spiky ball, um, uh, the, this, uh, this COVID virus. Um, coronaviruses have been with us for a long time. Um, in the probably 300 plus um, colds that, cold type viruses that we get exposed to or potentially exposed to, I guess, have been identified over our lifetimes. Um, some of those are coronaviruses, um, but this one is so much different and new to us. Our, our, we, we don't have the defense to it like uh, uh, others uh, that, that uh, we've come across. Um, again, everybody's seen the spiky ball. That spiky ball is the delivery package for the string of genetic code. Um, that genetic code um, simply tells the host that it gets into whether this is a human cold virus or it's a virus that infects trees to make more of that virus. That's all it does. There's a question whether a virus is even alive. It doesn't metabolize, it just gets to its next host and takes over cell operations to make more of it. Um, so um, <clears throat> it's uh, very machine-like. Whether it's an RNA virus with like COVID, DNA viruses like uh, herpes or uh, uh, that, that family of viruses um, in um, adenovirus, which uh, will come up later. So, um, uh, so it gets into its host with coronavirus. The spike that everybody's familiar with is how it attaches to the cells that it targets. Um, and it gets in, it releases its genetic code that genetic code is read like any other piece of RNA that's produced in our cells. And that code just tells that cell machinery to make more of this. Um, and uh, the um, goes out and infects more of us, spreads to other folks. It's on that spike, those proteins on that spike that it was found quite a while ago actually, that that, um, that is a good target. It is also, you know, our, 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 our um, natural immunity targets uh, in particular those spike proteins um, to inactivate, the word being used, neutralize that, that virus. And a lot of that groundwork was done 2002 with uh, SARS. In 2013, the, the Mideast uh, MERS virus, um, and uh, that fortunately those um, particular strains didn't turn out to be as uh, bad as this one. So um, the vaccines are that fragment of that <clears throat> genetic code, that RNA, that instructs our cells to make the uh, spike protein, just like would happen if you get a wild infection. Um, but fortunately, it's just for that spike protein. It's not for the whole darn thing. You don't make the spiky ball, you don't make the rest of the, you don't get the rest of the genetic code. Um, it is just the instruction to make that particular protein. That protein then triggers an immune response. So when the whole thing comes around, and it probably will, um, you have a weapon against it. So, um, so the challenges were um, and are, how do you get that instruction there? The, uh, so, so two main types of vac vaccine available. Just the mRNA vaccine, messenger RNA. This is just that piece of instruction. It's like this is the instruction manual. This is the vaccine. The whole virus 
just the page to make the spike. So it's just that page that's encapsulated and primarily a, a type of fat um, uh, that's injected. It gets in the cells. It's red like, again, any other piece of RNA and produces that response. That's the, uh, the two, uh, the uh, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. The um, viral vector is the other type of vaccine available. That piece of genetic code is inserted into the genome of an adenovirus. It's an adenovirus is a common uh, virus we are exposed to and we've been afflicted with. Um, causes colds, pink eye, sometimes GI symptoms. These particular, this particular strains that are used as, as uh, the viral vectors um, work on that dates back to the 80s. Um, there have been um, certain cancer therapies that have been tagged to those type of delivery systems. Um, the, uh, that, that virus in, is, um, infects our cells, if you will. Um, it can't reproduce in, in making these things. They've taken out the part of the genetics that allows it to reproduce. So it doesn't make you sick. It can't cause colds. It just is the way that that piece of code gets into our tissues and again triggers that immune response. Um, so the, there is a, my understanding, a, a, an additional type. I think it's a group out of Baylor that's working on it where they're taking that RNA and tagging it to a different type of molecule. Um, apparently is one that may not have the storage issues that the current ones do, um, uh, but not available to us yet. So I don't know a whole lot more about that one. <clears throat> um, so uh, when we get this thing, we develop an immune response. The immune response to it is uh, uh, a lot of times signaled by those um, effects we feel. So uh, the fatigue, headache, achiness, things that act like you have an infection, but you don't. You feel sick, but you're not. Um, uh, I recall my second one, uh, evening of the, after my second dose, I went over to the nursing home and was finishing up some charting that evening and all of a sudden, like I need to go lay down somewhere. I was tired. Uh, had a little bit of headache, maybe some chills. A little bit tired the next day, but you know, it beats getting sick. So, um, the uh, uh, so those more generalized symptoms that act like uh, we 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 have an infection, but again we don't. Some local things, uh, I've had a few folks get um, soreness in their arms, some redness, uh, uh, wonder if it's an allergy. It is, again, is just more a robust immune response. I'd say that um, the other thing, and, and uh, I don't know if you've heard of COVID arm, anybody heard that, that phrase? Um, soreness in the arm following injection, excuse me. Um, I think there's maybe two things going on there. Don't know for sure if this is what is referred to, but um, the, the, what I mentioned, the uh, swelling, redness, that type of thing. Um, the other is, um, I think, injection technique. We've asked a lot of people who are not um, necessarily started out their careers thinking they're going to be giving vaccine. Um, and sometimes that injection is given a little bit high on the shoulder and irritates the shoulder itself. My experience with that is that that, um, that will last a while, but um, generally goes away with just some home exercises and maybe having to use an analgesic for a little bit longer. Um, and, and that's not unique to COVID vaccine. I've seen that with uh, um, other vaccine. Um, so... Just, I think what's happening is <clears throat> more, uh, 
more, more frequent, more common, because there are a lot more people getting shots right now than, than in normal times. So um, the um, concern about allergy I think, um, is pretty minimal. Uh, there, uh, concerns would be in somebody who might have had um, severe allergic reaction to other vaccine. Um, although there's not a lot of common components between these and other stuff that's been available. A uh, person in my practice who had a systemic an anaphylaxis uh, reaction to flu, flu vaccine a number of years ago um, was very interested in getting this. Um, we just made sure it was at a place where a more severe allergic reaction could be handled, and that person did fine, had no trouble. So... Um, more serious issue in the news lately, uh, the clotting issue with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, the, uh, as we probably have all heard, it's about a half a dozen cases of severe uh, blood clots in the brain. Um, some fatalities from that. Uh, can't minimize uh, the, the trouble that that um, uh, occurred in those individuals. You know, we talk about numbers and statistics. It's one in a million. But if you're that one um, or you're their family, it's, it's uh, a lot more than just a, a remote chance. Um, my recommendations on that have been that if you are a premenopausal woman, um, consider getting one of the other two vaccines that have a zero out of a million chance of causing that. Uh, or if you're somebody who has a clotting disorder, um, that you might want to consider uh, one of the other two that have not had that issue. Um, the, uh, so. Then about, you know, the, the we're, we are, Somewhere in the neighborhood of half of the countries had at least one dose of vaccine. Uh, I think in the range of 20, 25%, um, roughly a, considered fully immunized. And so what's the, wh where are we? Why is uh, demand seem to be dropping off? What um, is driving that? And you know, we go back to maybe choice, right? Um, uh, what's our intention? Is it selfish? I don't want this. You feel relieved when you, when you got it. I'm not going to get that. Or, uh, you know, is it a choice to protect others? Uh, that's been, been part of, I think, you know, an issue with younger people who are maybe not so motivated to get it. They've heard that, you know, hear, hear that you know, young adults are gonna get through this illness pretty easily. I don't really need to have this. Um, but what if you give it to grandma or grandpa and they succumb? So uh, there's also that choice, that intention to um, protect others. Um, Convenience, most of uh, uh, the, the, the opportunity for this is somebody having to schedule appointments, uh, have to go somewhere um, for older folks being taken somewhere. Uh, so there's some of those hurdles. Um, hopefully uh, we will uh, be um, able to address that as, as um, time goes on with this. Uh, a little bit about that in a moment, uh, local efforts. Um, and then there's just some folks who won't do it, um, uh, no matter what the uh, uh, discussions have been or what have you, and I run into this with not just this vaccine, but, but lots. Uh, uh, things that have been around for a long time, influenza, pneumonia. Uh, so... Um, number of tough issues that way. Um, I want to address some of the myths. 
the things that I've heard. The fertility one. So the first time I heard the fertility one was as we are first getting vaccine at Colonial Manor. And one of the residents there said, I heard that this may cause problems with fertility. This is a 80, 90 some year old in the nursing home. I wasn't <laughs> kind of at a loss on that one. Um, the, uh, I uh, wasn't quite sure what that concern was. Um, but as far as, um, I, I, I have not been able to find out where that <clears throat> originated, but there is no evidence that there's any impact on fertility, uh, whether you know current or future. Um, there is no um, uh, suggestion of any issues with pregnancy. Now the vaccines were not studied on pregnant women but in the studies, there were women who became pregnant and there was uh, no impact. Um, a, uh, some of the others, um, that's gonna ch change my genetics. Um, mRNA doesn't do that. Um, and uh, mRNA is um, a copy of our own native RNA uh, mRNA is a copy of what's in our DNA, um, and it's read and broken down and gotten rid of on a continual basis our whole lives. It's how we take the information that's in our genetic code and make us. Um, these strands that are given are very specific for what they do um, and um, are broken down and metabolized very quickly. The um, uh, fragility of these things is pretty, uh, especially the, the, the mRNA vaccines. Um, there's instructions in the <clears throat> in, in, in uh, dosing these and, and, and thawing them and getting them prepared that, that talks about not shaking vials. Um, those molecules are so fragile that, that shaking might break them and make it inactive. So very specific kind of rolling, tipping, uh, twirling, um, to, to reconstitute these things. So, um, anyway. And back to, I guess, uh, um, you know, the attitude. Uh, that was my, talked about my first um, case that uh, identified. I identified. My last, most recent, one of my most recent, um, is uh, somebody was, was fairly ill with it, um, was getting worse, um, and had to send that person to hospital. Um, and uh, uh, kind of, you know, that, that call, um, knew that that could have been the last time we talked. And it turned out to be the case. Um, so again, this is here, it's hit hard. Um, uh, anybody doubts the seriousness of it, I think is not paying attention to um, uh, uh, the numbers like this and stories like this. Um, we have a tool to get to the other side and hopefully everybody can take advantage of that. So, um, and on that note, <clears throat> we have coming um, to a fire department or church near you. Um, on the 15th, um, Perrysville Fire Department will have a vaccine clinic um, in the morning and United Methodist Church in town here in the afternoon. Um, and same day, Shriver's Pharmacy, so Old Danner's, um, at New Hope. So uh, several opportunities coming up in a couple of weeks, 10 days. Um, and, and in the planning stage, um, probably going to happen on the 22nd at the high school. So um, advertising, I think, is the notifications that are coming out this week. So... Thank you.
Uh, we have an open mic, okay? So if you want to just walk on up there. And... Hi. Um, oh, good question. Back up. <laughs> um, first of all, mm -hmm. I just um, was listening to some of the things that you said. I made a couple notes. Um, let's see. My notes disappeared. <laughs> closer? I thought I was blasting you when I did that. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, you gave all the good things about the injections. Um, I guess I would like to know, are there any other alternative treatments out there that you found effective besides these injections? And, um, you know, when you said, well, everybody should consider um, mm -hmm. the different types of the seriousness of the situation, mm -hmm. which we do know this is a very yeah, bad yeah. virus, but are there any other um, possible things that we could possibly take or do or make it so that it's <clears throat> not so serious? Um, That's part one. <laughs> yeah, so uh, th there, there, are, there are some specific therapeutics for one who is ill with the disease. Um, the monoclonal antibody treatments, um, uh, there have been a role for steroids in stopping some of the cascades of inflammatory response that occurs, um, and, and that's otherwise supportive care. So uh, what do I mean by that? Um, uh, fluids, oxygen, respiratory support, those type of things. Um, there <clears throat> are not, there's no other specific therapeutic for um, COVID virus specifically. Um, I would say general health has, is significant. Um, st staying as well and fit as you can otherwise. Um, uh, the more serious illness has occurred in, not exclusive to, but occurred in people who are um, uh, do you want me at the mic? I'm sorry, or at the podium? We're okay. No. Um, uh, current people who with, with uh, other disease states, uh, diabetes being a big one, um, obesity being a big one, um, uh, ill otherwise. Okay. What, what, what actually? As far as, oh, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, like, like nutrition, um, just again in general. I know there's been talk about vitamin D, zinc. Um, no evidence that those will change course of illness or, or, or reduce susceptibility. Um, so. Ivermectin, HCQ, they just kind of disappeared. What happened? The, the hydroxychloroquine? Yes. Um, it didn't work and was dangerous. Um, uh, the, I believe the ball got rolling on that out of a report out of France way a year ago, ancient history now, um, that was very small and it was, uh, I believe, I, got, I think I'm, I'm close on the numbers, but I, 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 I don't know exactly, but <clears throat> I believe they compared, it was 16 original people in a hydroxychloroquine treatment um, in hospital compared to 10 or 12 that were not given it and, and concluded that there was some benefit, but what the conclusions were based on were eliminating six of the people in the study. One, because they, um, I think, didn't tolerate the medicine. One left the hospital. Three went to the ICU, got worse, and one died. Um, so if you eliminate the people who got worse on the treatment, it made the treatment look pretty good. Um, and uh, that is how the hydroxychloroquine thing got started. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it was, I, I guess, desperate times called for desperate measures. Um, it uh, uh, didn't work and, and again was dangerous. 
um, the vaccines that you're talking about? Uh -huh. Do people still get COVID after they get the vaccines? It's possible. So that's kind of the same thing with the HCQ then? No. 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 Okay. Um, so. Can I ask you this? Is there a yeah. particular reason why everybody's so gung ho on children getting these vaccines and everybody being vaccinated? Vaccinated, I use that term loosely. Yeah. Why, why do we want, the, what's the recovery rate of children getting, and um, the, the 20 year olds? And I know you said, well, we gotta worry about grandma, but right, what, yeah, what's, the, yeah. what's the big thing with kids getting it? Because the side effects of your injections, I think are probably far worse than anything pro pro probably, for those poor children. Probably not, yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, what does the vaccine yeah. insert say on it about pregnant people and or people wanting to become pregnant what is so so again there's say? there's no data we're looking at at you know a, probably in the neighborhood of a billion doses worldwide there is no evidence of any impact on fertility fertility Zero. now right what are the long term effects of this what have been the long term effects of the studies of these uh, injections uh, on not people because obviously we are the guinea pigs so long-term effects of animals using this. So, so if we go back to looking at um, what, what this vaccine is in, inducing in us, it's, it's inducing a portion of the immune response that is going to occur to you if you get infection. Right. And nothing else. Um, you're gonna get this immune response one way or another. Would my current immune response not do anything? My current, my current ability to have, like aren't there just all kinds of infections running through my body right now, but my, my no, own no. immune response is able to deal with that? Not, not infections. If you were infected, Excuse me, you would viruses, be sick. Excuse me, viruses, viruses, right? Um, probably sure. not. Sure. There are lots come of bacteria. On. Oh, come on. No, there are lots of bacteria. Okay. It's estimated that over a lifetime, we probably, uh, 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 again, I, uh, I, I, I can't. I guess I just want to make sure. careful on the numbers I, 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 I give you on this, but um, that we are probably capable of producing in the range of a billion types of immune responses. So why are we um, picking on this one particular be, virus? Why is this one particular virus so bad? Be, because so it's, much worse than all the rest of them. So much um, worse than all kinds of things. Is there not a doing these immune passports and if you don't have your little passport, then you can't sit next to this person over there and yada, yada, yada. That's so. kind of, I just, I just see a real huge, horrible thing going on down the road and it's pretty scary. Yeah trying to um, guilt us into, you know, oh, I'm gonna get grandma sick. Well, my mom, my mom did just fine. She was fine, grandma didn't, yeah. and we were around other people. But it's your, for, it's your fortunately, own immune system. Fortunately, um, we can say that for most people who get it, but it's still killing one out of 50 people who get this worldwide. And so that just, I mean, and so that uh, one out of 50 people die when they get this. Um, that's a lot of people who are. Um, I don't are see going, those yeah. numbers. I mean, I hate to, I then, know then, it's not of COVID, it's with COVID, it's next to COVID, it's, uh, you know, no, I've, I've, I've it's how you label it. Too. No. What um, happened to the flu? Is the flu gone? The flu, we don't even keep track of the flu we, anymore. No, we, we do. We, but there was track. no flu last year, so. This year? Yeah, um, Yeah, this past year. because most people are wearing their masks. <laughs> most people are washing their hands, are staying distant. So what prevents spread of one respiratory illness is gonna prevent spread of others. Sure. Flu's not gone. Flu's gonna be around forever. And so how do we test for the flu then? If we're all we're testing for is COVID and we kind of lump them all together. Um, so we can trust a clinician to judge whether this looks like influenza versus COVID. But we don't separate them out when we're counting them. We're just all lumping them all in the, no, we're not I won't keep yeah. arguing, but yeah. I just want everybody to kind of stop and think. So uh, the tests are very specific for COVID. They and I just, yeah. and the other thing is I want my freedom. I don't yeah. want, and it's not being selfish. 
-hmm. It's me having that choice to say, yes. I don't want your experimental injection because I don't want to be a guinea pig. Yeah. And I don't want, uh, I don't know what the long-term effects are. Mm -hmm. So, and I want everybody yeah. else to mm -hmm. sit and think about Can you address that last term. question, Father, and then maybe let the next person go sure. as far as, yep. I mean, uh, the, the last question was kind of a question of freedom. Sure. Um, and mm -hmm. maybe you can just address that just a little bit. So I'd be happy to. I mean, I, I think uh, when we talk about freedom, we talk about that, that true sense of freedom, not necessarily being uh, just about me, but that sense of freedom being in relationship to, uh, to the creator. So that, that freedom, when we put our, ourselves in line with that, um, we would, uh, you know, be, be bringing about life, bringing about, you know, a flourishing of life. So I, I think the uh, approach that, uh, that I, I certainly understand as, uh, as uh, the church is that uh, we are called to um, care for our fellow persons, right? So we're called to, uh, to do those things that are going to help us to be able to um, protect life, recognizing uh, a, a life issue and the good of others. So the challenge for us is to, um, to do those things that are going to help in, in that regard. Um, and so, you know, God, you know, we, we kind of believe that God has given us gifts to use, intellect, uh, uh, to be able to create things that are able to help in, in situations that allow us to, to grow in that freedom. I'm not telling people what to do, but just to recognize that importance of being able to assess and to always look for what's going to be, you know, good in that promoting life, promoting um, care for one another as brothers and sisters, recognizing the dignity of, of each person. Thank you. First, I'd like to um, thank the organizers for this event to be able to have this kind of open discussion. I uh, really appreciate the explanation you did on the vaccine and how it works in the messenger RNA. Can you talk a little bit about how the current vaccines protect or what the variants are that are being identified now that the regular COVID that everybody got, mm -hmm. now there's these different more contagious or more perhaps dangerous variants? How does the vaccine or how do, does it protect against the variants? Um, it, <clears throat> so, so the regular has changed. The regular is now a variant. Um, my understanding that this, the, the, the B117 is, is more common now than the original strains, uh, at least in some regions. Um, it, from my understanding is that the vaccines are, are protective against the variants that have shown up and have shown pretty good um, activity against them. Um, one of the things that we need to do is quit giving this opportunity to make more of those variants. Um, uh, the more chance it has to try to replicate um, the more chance there are for errors in that, and those errors that then uh, make it potentially more contagious, um, uh, certainly is the, the big thing, um, more virulent, uh, able to cause more severe disease uh, would, would be another issue, but um, yeah. And my second, my second question is, could you could mention a little bit or explain this term of herd immunity I know yeah. we're somewhere between, you said 25 to 50% vaccinated. Yeah. There's kind of a benchmark of hoping to get to 80%, mm -hmm. but how does herd immunity work? So, you know, that, that's a concept of there's enough um, protection in, in the herd, in the population, that this doesn't have any place to go anymore. It can't get to its next host. Um, and the, the numbers on that are, are um, a bit, range a bit wide and, and <clears throat> you know, how close are we? Uh, it's, um, uh, 
dependent on how many people have had illness already um, and then immunized. I, 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 I can't say I've heard a concrete number on we need 80%, we need 95%, we need 72%. Um, uh, but, I, but I think you know, in that, certainly gonna need to be well above 50%. Um, uh, range um, to, to get the protection we need to, to kind of put this fire out. So, um, if, if I could, uh, booster. Actually, my question was going to be in the study of viruses, you know, mm. since time began, yeah. what happens? Does a virus die out of its own? You know, what, what, when do question. we know that we get past all that? And I know this uh, yeah, is a new I, virus, so we Yeah, I, I, yeah I've thought about it. You know, so so this is not the first coronavirus we've dealt with. We've, we, there are other cold type illnesses that um, are coronaviruses. What happened the last time there was a new one? Nobody knows um, uh, whether that was 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago. Um, the big difference with this one is we have airplanes um, and it gets around pretty quick now. Um, maybe the last time there was a new one of these it was just as bad, um, but it just didn't have the opportunity to get to everybody like this has. So um, do, do, do other viruses die out? I, I, I don't know, maybe. I think they probably just roll into what we, uh, we'll end up having um, uh, in our lexicon of colds and other illnesses. So. Some of it's crystal ball stuff. Um, ask in 25 years, you know, uh, so. Uh, a few minutes ago, you said that we need to quit giving the virus an opportunity to make the variants. Yeah. And is that just through getting people of the vaccine or are there other things that we can do to stop that opportunity? Um, so if it can't get to the next person one way or another, right. it can't get to the next person. Okay. Um, whether that is the distancing, the masking, the um, precautions we take, or it's immunity, whether that's um, from infection or uh, immunization. Okay, so, yeah. Does uh, anyone else have any questions? I actually don't think I need mic, but uh, I will use the mic. First of all, I'd like to say that it was such a unique evening for me. I didn't have to sit at my recliner with a remote in my hand. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> I didn't have to change channels. Everything that's been said tonight has been so positive in my mind. And I really appreciate all of you coming. It's just been wonderful. I, uh, I had to think of when there's decisions that have to be made, I'm sorry. Okay. There are decisions that is, I've had to make in my life like everybody else. Uh, we've all had our um, times where we've had things that's happened in our lives that um, we just don't know where to turn. And I've had that since I was a young fella. But as I grew older and had opportunities that came my way, um, I had great teachers, I had great brothers, uh, certainly I've had great doctors uh, that's really guided me along the way, uh, but I have had to make decisions. I just had to think of the time, and, and I bring this up, and Dr. Tom Check will appreciate this. Uh, you know, I started out uh, in, 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 I taught school, got in, and I turned, I got into business then in sales, uh, played a little bit of golf. Didn't, I decided 
on the golf course the last time I played golf that there's something better for me in life than on the golf course. It was very frustrating for me. So guess what I turned to? Dr. Tom Check, he would know that. I, I got out into God's wonderful, wonderful world, and I appreciated what he's given us, and that's wildlife, particularly my birds. I'm a very avid birder. That did so much in my life. You know, there's so many things out there that we don't think of that can be so positive in our lives. And, and I'll tell you, I am here to tell you this. I thank my good Lord every day for giving me those opportunities. We don't always have choices, but I'll tell you this right now, folks. All you have to do is look at, at and there were some comments tonight. There's, over, there's millions of people that have died from this, this COVID. That ought to be enough to make us realize that we have to do our parts. And, and I think the good Lord above has provided us with the possibilities of doing our parts, each and every one of us. And it's very frustrating to me, particularly when I do have the remote on and I am watching television, that I have to listen to some of the negative things. And I don't mean politics necessarily. That does apply, certainly. But it, it is very frustrating when people question why we, we should be doing this and why we should be doing that. We get professional people out there that have been able to provide us with the opportunities to make the right decisions. And if we have to question that and we don't make the right decisions, then it's, we have to look at ourselves in here. One question to Dr. Tom Chek. Uh, do you think in the future there will be the annual shot for the COVID, like uh, the flu shots? Uh, that, that's a crystal ball question. I know. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I, 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 and I realize that there's been a lot of uh, discussion about it, but it, it hasn't really come up. But I just mm -hmm. wondered, what are your feelings necessarily about that? I think to be determined. Um, okay. we, we just don't know how long immunity is going to last and, and uh, where this thing's going to go. Okay. So. okay. Good. Uh, yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Wonderful. Okay. I'll just stand in front of the mic and say goodbye as far as uh, um, I think we're very, very fortunate for the, uh, the talent. And uh, thank you very much uh, for the investment that you uh, put in for tonight. Uh, we're fortunate, we're blessed. Um, I'm not uh, uh, discouraged by the small crowds at all. I think Mother Teresa said it best as far as it's about faithfulness, not success. And, and the word will get out as far as that goes. So we're very thankful for tonight. And I think everybody enjoyed themselves very much. And thanks for everybody that uh, asked questions too, okay? Thanks. <laughs>